This video is meant to be a companion to my most recent video on debugging, which I will link up here. You can watch them in any order, but they are intended to go together. The debugging video, of course, helps you find bugs. This video is going to be about some techniques that I use to catch bugs before they happen or set up scenarios where you have fallbacks so that if something does break, it doesn't crash your game. So we're going to revisit this prototype of mine. Today I want to look at this NPC system and specifically the way we pull these portraits and you'll see we've got a happy Sean, a happy Bill, and then an angry Sean. So let's take a look at how this works. First of all, we've got a set of portraits for each character that are following the convention of name, hyphen, mood. We've got a default as our fallback and we've got my buddy Ajay here who isn't in this demo but I love Ajay. So hi Ajay. Let's take a look at this display portrait function. It takes a character name, a character mood, and it attempts to build the portrait based on that. So the first thing it's going to do is generate a path with the portrait folder. Pull that down here in the comments just so you can see it. So this is this first string replacement here is the portrait location. The next is the character name, then the hyphen, and then the mood.png. And so what we're going to do here is check that against resource loader. If it exists, it's going to skip this entire block and it's just going to load the portrait. If it doesn't exist, the next thing that it's going to do is look for this Sean.png, which is the emotionless version. It's my resting emotionless face. Um, so it's going to try to re define path as simply folder sean.png, which is this right here. And then it's going to repeat that process. If it exists, we're going to push out a warning, just like we did in the last video, that lets us know, hey, you tried to load, you know, happy, but we didn't get happy, so we just gave you regular Sean. And if it doesn't exist, it's going to push out an error, which is going to stand out a little bit more. Um, and then it's going to default to this portrait right here, default.png, and it's going to display that. And the reason I do it that way is so that if I'm testing the game, I don't need it to break. I'd rather it show something than fail on me. And then I push this error out so that I'm aware that the problem occurred. When it comes time that the game is basically baked and all I'm doing is hunting for bugs, I might not use this block here because now I'm at a point where I don't need it to just work. I want it to actually, like I don't want to ship the game showing a default gray box kind of programmery art portrait. So what I'll do is this assert function. So you give it a statement just like if else. And if that statement returns false, it's going to halt the game immediately. So it's not just going to push a warning or an error out like we did previously down here, it's going to send this message to the debugger and then it's going to stop the game dead in its tracks. Let me show you how this looks just real quick. Let's take a look at my JSON file. So each part of the conversation has a character name, an emotion, and then what they're saying. If I change this emotion to WTF, which is an emotion I have pretty regularly, you'll see what's going to happen here. Instead of that happy, like we were getting before, now I'm getting the default Sean.png. That's my fallback. That's my safety failure. If on the other hand, John, I'm put this back to happy, that's actually going to hit our assert, right? So because we don't have a character named John, so it's going to halt the game right here and tell me art for John does not exist. And if I go back to the original format and run this again, you'll see our fallback for testing. I get John and I get this default portrait and I get a message in my debugger that that portrait doesn't exist, but I can continue testing and I can make a note of this and come back to it later. Another example of this, I'm gonna pop over to my scene manager. I'm using a fallback here in the loading screen. So I've got this start transition function that initializes my transition and I pass it the name of the animation that I wanna use. And so right at the top of this function, I'm checking whether that animation exists. If it doesn't, I'm gonna push out a warning and then I'm gonna set the animation name to something that I know does exist. This fade to black is already proven to work. So if I pass in an animation name that doesn't exist, the game's gonna keep playing. I'm gonna get maybe at worst the fade to black animation when maybe I wanted to wipe or something. And I'm gonna get that warning. So I can continue testing and I can make a note of this and I can fix it later. But you know, if I shipped with this, the game isn't gonna crash when it gets past a string that doesn't map to an actual animation.
The next thing I want to look at is actually also in this scene manager example. Uh, and it's something I'm going to call flexible initialization. I don't know if that's a thing, but that's what I'm going to call it. So in this game, let me fire up this demo. The reason I want to show this as an example is, you know, there are two ways that a level can be initialized. Uh, it can be loaded through the scene manager, but then I can also pop into any level. Here's level three, and I can test the scene specifically. And then he starts right here instead of, you know, wherever he would have relative to transitioning from another room. The reason I'm calling this flexible initialization is because under any circumstance that I fire up one of these levels, it's going to behave the way that I want it to behave in that moment. What I'm doing is, as soon as the level starts, I disable this character right here, which includes hiding it. And then if I've got level data, this level data handle object, that means I'm coming from another level and I'm going to need to reposition it in front of the door that I came through. And if that data isn't present, that means I've skipped over that step. But the end result is that whether I enter a level through natural gameplay or through testing, everything just works. Now, of course, you have to remember to include your player in every level or else you're going to throw an error. And we're going to look at how to create custom node warnings. So you can set that up pretty easily in your own project. So here is my level script. I can say at tool, and that's going to allow this code to run in the editor. In order to catch where you've forgotten to include your player, uh, we're going to set up this code and give us that angry yellow triangle that we've seen with built in nodes. So by adding just a couple of these lines, what we're going to do is every time the player value changes, we're going to force our array of configuration warnings to update. And because we're using this in like the most minimal way possible, all we need to do is check just the one. So if player equals null, meaning we haven't assigned this player, it's going to return this array with our one warning. And if it is assigned, it's going to return an empty array, meaning we have no warnings. Now, if we had multiple things that we were checking for, instead of returning a discrete array, we would be appending the relevant ones to that before we return that. But since we're doing a very basic version of this, we're just going to return the one warning level requires a player node. So I'm going to save this, click over here. So you can see we do have a player defined. So if I remove that, and we have nothing to find. I'm actually going to have to, for this to take effect, I'm going to have to close level three and reopen it. And now you see we've got our yellow warning. If I hover over it, I get level requires a player node. Now, if I click over here to assign it and select my player, that warning goes away. If I remove it, it comes back. Now, obviously, this is only going to help you catch issues with things that are authored at development time. This is an in editor solution to catching a bug before it occurs. <laughs> But in the previous examples, the fallbacks and the flexible instantiations, these are things that will keep your project from failing at runtime if you've forgotten to do something like create a character portrait that you are trying to load but doesn't exist. The last thing I want to show you is lazy instantiation which is you can see here in this load or create method. I'm actually going to click over to that. So my settings window allows me to set these different values, quit and resume and have them be saved, right? And the way I've got this set up is anytime I need to access those saved values, I do so through this static function. Static meaning I can call it through the class rather than a member of that class. And because I'm storing this user preference data in my globals, which is an auto load singleton right here, the very first time the game fires up, it calls that load or create function, which you can see checks to see whether that data exists. If it does, it returns the existing data. If it doesn't, it creates a new one. And so as long as I'm careful to always access my user prefs through this, I'm always guaranteed to get something, either the defaults on that first creation, or I'm gonna get what was saved. You never have to worry about accidentally trying to access something before it exists and having your game crash as a result. So these are some techniques that I use throughout all of my projects to help me write code that's a little bit more reliable, even if there are errors. And I just like to be in the habit of writing code that can catch its own errors. As always, I really appreciate the comments and the feedback. 
Some folks messaged me about volume issues on the last one, which I hope I've resolved in this one. Please let me know if I haven't. And I have to say, when I started this YouTube channel, I was a little bit worried that you know I'd be dealing with your standard angry internet comments. Everybody has been so unbelievably kind and honest. I hate to talk about it because I'm afraid it's gonna go away, but I don't know. Just thank you so much for keeping it civil and friendly. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. As always, Please be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I'll see you in the next video.